Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Dayton. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. It's so exciting to see a full house tonight and apparently a, even a line out the door. Uh, you know, this started as a very a small, simple idea, and it's been so exciting to see the, the energy that has, has formed around it and to have the Star Tribune's interest in Minnesota Public Radio. And apparently we were even, this topic was discussed on KFAN today, which I think is how you know you really made it. So... <laughs> I assume this is the K-Fan bump that we're seeing here tonight with the, uh, with the turnout. I, I want to extend my thanks to our entire panel uh, this evening, but I'm not going to uh, do their introductions. I'm going to let our moderator introduce the panel, and so I'm here to, to welcome you and to introduce our moderator. And uh, our moderator, Poppy Harlow, is, uh, is a New York-based correspondent for CNN. And if you read her full online bio, you'll see names like Jay-Z and Warren Buffett. You'll, you'll read about her covering... Uh, events like the Davos Forum in Switzerland, uh, but I, I found actually that her Twitter bio really kind of boiled it down to the essentials, and here's how her Twitter bio reads, CNN correspondent, made in Minnesota, Brooklyn transplant, Vikings fan forever. <laughs> so Poppy and I actually know each other from, from high school. She is a, a native and proud Minnesotan, and we're so excited that she could be back here tonight to lead this conversation, and so please join me in welcoming Poppy Harlow in our full panel. Hello. It's freezing in here, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we're working on the heat. Yeah. <laughs> we're working it's a hot on topic. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the nice introduction, for the great idea. Eric, Corey, uh, my husband and I were having drinks um, in New York a while ago and talking about how much we all love Minnesota, and this idea came up, and Eric followed through to the nth degree with this great venue, these great panelists. You really did everything. So thank you for, for hosting and to the walker for hosting. Sure. Okay. Applause. <laughs> great idea. Um, sold out crowd. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. There's some people in the lobby. There's a few empty seats. So uh, they're going to try to let some people in, I hope, that are waiting in the lobby as we go on with the evening as they can. Uh, but as Eric said, my name is Poppy Harlow. Uh, I was born and raised here in Minneapolis. Uh, my mom is sitting here in the, in the second row, still lives here. Um, I went to Blake High School all throughout, or all the way through kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, I, I, I love telling people about Minnesota. I love bringing my friends here. Every time Minnesota is in the news, I make sure people know that I am from this great state. And I talk about it a lot because I think that um, if you haven't been here, you don't get it. And when you're here, you get it. And tonight is about talking about all of the great things that make up Minnesota and all of the challenges challenges we face and how we can make it better. Um, and so I'm excited to be here. A little bit about me, I grew up on Lake the Isles. My family still lives there. I grew up skating. I was a figure skater uh, at Parade Stadium. That's where I met some of my best friends, Joe Hobbenhofer, who's up there, Missy Hoffman, Nicole, Ted, uh, a lot of my great friends, Melissa Anderson from Blake, uh, all the way through. And um, I met my husband here, my awesome husband at, uh, at remember when Filios was at uh, mm -hmm. Calhoun Square, <laughs> 10 years ago, I met him here. So it's been a great state for me. When I was thinking about doing this panel, I called up, we have a, an amazing library at CNN that can do research on anything you need. So I called them and I said, full disclosure, this is not a story, this is a panel I'm doing and I need to know all the cool things about Minnesota. And they said, but you're from there, Poppy. <laughs> I said, I know, but I don't know everything about Minnesota. So give me, give me some stats. So. Here's what they came up with. Did you know that apparently the first, <laughs> I don't even know if they're all right, that the first people <laughs> came to Minnesota during the last ice age? I think that that seems huh. <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> what? A little, what? Bit of a, little bit of a joke there that they sent me. Um, things here that were invented here, oxygen masks, water skis, the bunt pan, uh -huh. Zubas. My oh, husband yeah. said, don't call them Zumbas. Zubas, <laughs> the pants. 3M and the post-it, obviously, which who told me it was going to be called fry paper? That was yeah. about the guy that invented it. Yeah, invented it, it right? yeah. Cheerios. Mm -hmm. The Juicy Lucy. Does everyone know what this is? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> we have 18 Fortune 500 companies, best parks in the United States, 11,842 11, lakes, not sure why they rounded down on that one. 
<laughs> 69,200 miles of rivers and streams. 680 miles of Mississippi River, of the Mississippi River. As Christine taught me tonight, more shoreland than Alaska, Florida, and Hawaii combined. Consistently on Fortune's list of best places to live, I actually think Eden Prairie was the top one a few years ago. A host of amazing people, names known and unknown, my panelists, people in the audience here, Garrison Keeler, a Prairie Home Companion, basically defined my childhood, driving up to our cabin every single weekend in our Oldsmobile station wagon, listening to that. Tom Friedman, New York Times columnist, someone I admire a lot. Walter Mondale, Prince, is it artist formerly known as? Do we know? Just Prince now. Is it? Okay, back we're back. To, back Great. To Prince. Okay. <laughs> Jim Moore, the creative director of GQ. Uh, Barkat Abdi, an actor, a Somali actor who I profiled last year, the actor in Captain Phillips. Uh, he won a BAFTA, nominated for an Academy Award. Diablo Cody, the amazing screenwriter. The Coen Brothers. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Bob Dylan. Carol Bartz, the former CEO of Yahoo. I thought, I was thinking on the plane of names, I thought Leanne Chin. What an awesome entrepreneur, <laughs> right? Awesome. And Paul Bunyan, my favorite. Yeah, Paul Bunyan. Apparently we have a state drink. It is milk. That's what <laughs> I Again, CNN Library. But craft you, brew. Craft Come beer, on, right? All right, craft we're changing that. And uh, no one plays a better game of hockey. So with that, let's get started. Uh, so we're going to open it up for Q&A at the end, so please think of questions that you have. We'll run mics around uh, uh, throughout, but it's always really awkward when I ask for questions and no one has them, so please <laughs> think of questions that you might have. Uh, let me introduce our panel. Um, let, me start, uh, let me start with Christine. We have Christine Fricti, who's joining us, who is the only Minnesota native on the panel. Outside of me. Other, you, yeah. <laughs> Who is CEO of Call McVoy, a, a huge and influential advertising agency here in Minnesota. They have consistently been named among the best places to work by the Star Tribune, by Ad Age, etc. They have had nine consecutive years of growth, um, and they work with a ton of partners of names you know, like Caribou Coffee, General Mills, Green Belt Beer, Land of Lakes, Medtronic. Uh, they also did the Explore Minnesota Tourism campaign, which we're going to play some of for you. Uh, and she's lived her whole life here except for two years in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But you came back. I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, have, we have Bruce Bildston with us, who is a partner and chief marketing officer of Faribault Woolen Mill, something I'm a really big fan of. Uh, two years there now, three years? One. Just one. Just one. <laughs> Just one year there. So he's been here for a long time. Uh, although not from Minnesota, and worked for many, many years with Fallon, a big ad, big ad and successful ad agency here. It became one of the most award-winning agencies in the world. Um, and he joined Faribault Woolen Mill as the CMO. Uh, previously, you worked with uh, clients, BMW, PBS, United Airlines, but you went to Faribault, and we'll talk more about this, to talk about and share the message and the brand of the rebirth of this really revered American institution. And the best... Christmas gift I bought my husband was a scarf from Faribault Woolen Mill at ABC Home and Carpet in New York, and I bought it because it was from and made in Minnesota. He needs another one. <laughs> Coming tomorrow to get that. And next to me, we have Andrew Blauvelt. Did I say yes. it right? Yes. We talked about this pronunciation. <laughs> Senior curator and um, of architecture and design here at the Walker Art Center. Uh, from 1999 to 2009, he was the d design director here at the Walker. He, you came here because of, Minis because of the Walker. I did. Which is an important point about how many great institutions there are here that draw people here and then they tend to always stay. Uh, you've gotten numerous awards, um, including the 2009 National Design Award for Institutional and Corporate Achievement. And uh, he's the author of Brand New World, which is an essay on contemporary branding and including an exhibit on that here in 2011. And finally, last but not least, we have Thomas Fisher. He's a professor in the School of Architecture and a dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. You have written seven books. Actually, eight. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> I think you sent me this bio. Well, I know. Who wrote this? I wrote another one. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> 325 articles? Yeah. Is that, is that a little a more now. Okay, a little more. <laughs> <laughs> 
Named a top 25 design educator four times by Design Intelligence, has lectured at 36 universities and uh, over 150 public meetings, et cetera. So we have pretty amazing bios, amazing people. So thank you guys for being here. It's going to be a fun night. Not what, Also fun, not everyone agrees on everything. So we're going to have an interesting discussion. Uh, I'm going to play two videos, two quick 30-second spots. These videos come from the Only in Minnesota Tourism Campaign. Hashtag Only in MN. See, Joe? I'm already, Joe's been Do helping me, me the tech guy. Do you want me to tell them a little bit about it before, before you... Sure, go ahead. Then I can figure <laughs> out how it works. <laughs> so how many of you are from Minnesota? Raise your hands. Wow. <laughs> like born? Born. Born. Born here. Born here. Oh. Born here. OK. So when you talk to, you probably have experienced this as we did. We did a lot of stakeholder interviews inside the state and outside of the state. If you're in the state, you know a lot about how awesome it is. If you're outside of the state of Minnesota, hmm, we did a poll and they said, I think it's cold there. Uh, yes. That was the first, that was the first thing they said. Cold. And then it's like Prince. And then it's cold again. <laughs> and then maybe Garrison Keillor. So obviously from a tourism perspective only, and this discussion is about uh, the brand of the state and um, the economy, so this is just kind of a sliver of the conversation. We really had a huge opportunity to help um, the tourism industry really elevate the unique, authentic experiences you can only find in Minnesota. Thus, thus the hashtag only in Minnesota. Uh, we created traditional communications, but really wanted to accentuate this by using the people of Minnesota to share their stories about the unique, special experiences that you can only find in Minnesota. Because when most people travel, it comes down to the four F, or the three Fs, friends, family, and Facebook. So again, we wanted to make sure that we could uh, inspire, but also um, inform and ignite the consumer base and all of you here to share those stories. So you'll see two television spots, and then I, we have uh, some other content if we have time to share with you that really try to bring together um, you know, why a family would want to come to Minnesota, why the guys would want to come to Minnesota with some unique, specific um, destinations. What's the Facebook? People want places that's cool, that are cool to share on Facebook? 54% of people use Facebook to plan their vacations. They're inspired by their friends and their family. So if they see what their friends are doing in Minnesota or in other states, that really informs their decision. So strategically, we, we felt that social media was going to play a huge role for us. That's and incredible. And we have a whole pool of um, Instagrammers, but also consumers that are out there wow. bringing this campaign further to life. That's amazing. All right, we're going to roll these videos. Also, guys up there, if there are people waiting in the lobby, we do have a few empty seats if you want to bring people in. Take a trip. Find the trail. Look out. Call some friends. Hello. Come on, bring it in. Look at you. This is going to be good. Look at that. Meet your hero. See a bird. Nice leather. Nice wool. How'd they make that? Oh, that's how. Play with the puppets. Conquer your fear. Read to the chickens. Shake, break, laugh, run, jump, smile, look up, and discover a world that's only in Minnesota. All right, so that's one of two. They didn't tell me my assignment was audiovisual. Take a trip. So pass some water. Pass some trees. Wait, don't you dare pass that. Plot a course. Get out. Look around. No, really, look around. Take hold. Take a breath. Jump. Climb. Seek your fortune. Laugh. Pinch yourself, because this is happening. And it might not ever happen again. Well, not like this. Because this kind of trip happens only in Minnesota. It's true. <laughs> so, what you know, we try so hard to bring our friends here, my husband and I, because when they come, they love it. They want to come back every year. They don't want to leave. But it's it's getting over that hurdle of it is more than cold. It is. And. I wonder in talking to your, this is a client of your firm, a big client, in talking to them um, and in talking to the stakeholders in the state and in t talking to the influencers you know, who are on here on the stage with us, what did they tell you that led you to this? What was the message that needed to get across? We really had an opportunity to celebrate, inform, and inspire the unique experiences that you only have in Minnesota. So again, a lot of you saw iconic places that you have been. Hopefully you've had great memories. But 
I think the unique part of this was it was combined with a significant social media component driven by consumers. So obviously these are kind of a base, the television spots, try to you know evoke that emotion that you had from those places, but it's really to get you as consumers to go, you know what, I'm up at the cabin, or I'm, I just passed Betty's Pies, or I just jumped off a cliff at Split Rock, and they're starting to share their experiences. We also use this on a business level, not in terms of um, Fortune 500 companies, but if I own a resort, you can only have this X experience at this resort. So we also came up with this thing called hashtag tag. I don't know if any of you participated in hashtag tag Is that one of these? Other, this may be. Some of them, but again, part of it was just, again, really trying to ignite um, the people of Minnesota to celebrate the unique and authentic experiences that they have. So a lot of the work that you see on the digital billboards and in print are consumer-inspired um, content. So again, we have digital billboards in Kansas City and in Canada that are really bringing to life the unique experiences that people here and then out of state um, believe are, are special. Um, the traffic to our, the website where you get a lot of this information has increased almost 20%. So again, I think it's created a conversation, but it's also ignited the people and the pride that we have for our state in celebrating those unique and authentic experiences. But what we were talking before, this is just about why you'd come to Minnesota to have a great vacation and a great experience. This panel is much broader about why would you move to Minnesota for your life. Um, so I think that's what's going to be an interesting discussion as we continue talking tonight. CNN Bureau in Minnesota. I, I agree with that. <laughs> I definitely agree. Mom would be so happy. Um, so I want to get to Tom in a moment on that because I want you to respond to the videos because we sure. were having a lively conversation about that before. But I want to, before I do that, I want to get to, to the next question. For you, Bruce, talking about Faribault Woolen Mill is this iconic Minnesota uh, entity. And this is what is in right now. This is what is hip is get, you know, whether it's in Brooklyn oh, or whether it's that. here. I know you hate the word. I hate that. But. But. <laughs> this is, but it is, I, I do think that people really do want to know, and I think my generation, the millennial generation, wants to know where, the, as much as they can, their products are coming from, whether it's what they're eating, what they're wearing, sure. where they're going, what they're doing, and isn't that at the essence of what Faribault is? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a recovering ad guy. You know, I spent <laughs> two and a half decades as, in doing that, and, and there's a lot of contrivance. And what was really attractive to me about this thing is it's the real deal. Uh, it's an honor to represent this company. Mm -hmm. And where we are defines this mill. I mean, people come from all over the world to come and see it. You know, the, our, our new mill was built in 1892. <laughs> and they go through wow. it. And you know, we use machines dating from 1905 because only those can make what, what we make. Uh, and people come and, they, and they, they care, they know about this place. We, we, you know, we, there's an old slogan from the mill that we still use, loomed in the land of lakes, and, and it, mm -hmm. the area defines who we are and what we are. And it's, it's the real thing. And people not only want to see the mill and, 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 it's, and, and what we make there, but they're, they're interested in the area and where we live. And the mill was defined by this area as well. I mean, it, like so many of the quote-unquote heritage brands here, it came out of a necessity, you know, that this um, people needed to stay warm. You know, they, they took the local wool from the sheep and made, made blankets to keep people warm here. So it's, it's a real thing, and it's a real draw, and we're defined by where we, where we come and from. Do you find that that's resonating more now? It is. It is. And, and I kind of shudder at, oh, we're in, because... Uh, you are you in. Know, Accept it. I, I, don't like, <laughs> I don't like to be called, you know, there's this thing called heritage brands, and I think it's, it's a brand, and I don't even like the word brand anymore, but it's a brand with heritage. You know, it's the real deal. It's, it's the real thing, and it's 150 years old mm -hmm. next year. So, Andrew, you have lived, I mean, you came to Minneapolis for this great place, yeah. Walker. <laughs> and you knew about it before. I mean, its reputation mm -hmm. is far outside of the, the state lines. Yeah. But where have you seen branding, even if we don't want to use that word, branding efforts succeed and fail where you have lived and worked? <laughs> um, well... Well, if I broaden it a little bit, because like this whole idea, what we call place branding, which is another subset of branding activity. We all know branding for companies and corporations and organizations, but this idea of branding a place is, is a new kind of development. And I know a lot of people have issues with the idea of branding, including our former advertising 
<laughs> but uh, anytime branding works, because uh, branding's necessary, or you see branding happen, because anytime you have a surplus of something, and you need to create differentiation in the marketplace. So what does that mean? Well, for tourism, I could visit any 50 states, or I could go abroad. So you're in competition with other states and other locales, other geographies. Um, you're in competition for jobs, for talent. You want to attract a certain kind of talent, skilled, skilled labor to the state. So there's all these levels of competition. The most interesting now is the switch to cities. And so my examples are cities-based, and this will be uh, you know, for the outstate people heretic, but <laughs> um, one of the more interesting ones, I think, historically was the I, I Love New York mm -hmm. campaign, sure. I Heart New York. I'm sure you all can picture it in your head. That was originally created as a tourism campaign for the whole state of New York, mm. but it really succeeded as a, yeah, it, but now we identify it with New York City specifically, and that um, was, the mark was created by Milton Glaser, um, but that was um, launched. When was that? Do you remember when? 77, okay. 1977. And why I think it worked was because if, you, if you're old enough, like me, to remember, in the 1970s, New York was on the verge of bankruptcy. Well, I was just going to say, it came at a very hard time for the city, interestingly. Yeah, right. yeah in 75, there was that famous kind of pseudo headline that the Newsday, I think, yeah. had that was uh, Ford to New York, drop dead, yeah. which was to the city because they were on the verge of bankruptcy. So like no one cared about it. And so they really, you know, it was this kind of hmm. bootstraps up kind of approach. And it still resonated. And of course, it reignited itself after 9-11 in a different way. And I, I heard uh, New York uh, again, or I heard New York uh, even more. Um, the other example is um, another city with, in the 1990s, which really started this whole place branding thing, which was this campaign called Cool Britannia, which was uh, done for London. And if you remember London, again, if you're old, <laughs> bad food, bad weather. <laughs> there wasn't a lot going but on not for at all it. Now. That's not no, all no, are totally transformed received. to a really, you know, obviously world class cosmopolitan yeah. city with fantastic food, with fantastic culture, um, be beyond its just typical British culture. And that was, um, you know, part of New Labour's rebranding effort around, um, you know, basically England, but it was really for London. It's kind of a new financial center, a new cosmopolitan center. So those are kind of interesting examples. I think everything else, it's kind of hard to succeed. Like apparently there was a story that Switzerland was trying to rebrand itself in the 90s. That's um, what? I don't really know. I think this is part of the branding <laughs> effort. Is branding is like psychoanalysis for the for the country or something. For, you know, so like Switzerland, we you know there's neutrality, there's banking. It's a safe place to be. But they were re trying to reassert themselves. So they did a study, but they couldn't really get out past the the things that define you. Mm -hmm. And so it was this kind of early first failure. It never really launched itself. In fact, so they couldn't escape their destiny. I think. <laughs> I think we, I lived in Switzerland, in yeah. Zermatt, of all small place, beautiful, beautiful place, but you're right, I can't really think of what defines it exactly. You know, but, they were like cuckoo clocks, and like, <laughs> you know, like this whole like research watches. that you do, you know, watches were popular, this is in the 90s. Um, so yeah, they couldn't really escape that, it's interesting. I think, uh, well, one of the things that I think Minnesota has going for it is so many people that haven't been here and spend time here don't know what we are, don't know how we roll, and then when they come, <laughs> and the, you know, there's so much unknown, there yeah. aren't as many predefined conceptions other than cold and a few that you saw, but I think we have a big opportunity there. Okay, so to you, Tom, I wanna talk about what makes a city, a state, a region, what have you. By the way, it's so much cooler in here. Thank you, guys, it feels great. At least on stage it does. Doesn't it, do you, does everyone feel okay? Yeah. Yes, yeah, great, I'm so happy. Um, what, what makes a city, a state, a region attractive to the creative class? And I'm gonna read this quote from the sure. economist sure. Richard Florida. So people, yeah. so this economist, um, a Toronto-based, I think. University of Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Came, came and did a huge study on what, where the creative class goes. Um, and here's what he wrote. Of all the cities in the United States that received high scores on creativity, uh, in other words, high technology, lots of innovation, attracting young people, tolerant place for racial and ethnic people, gays and lesbians, one stood out. And that was Minneapolis and St. Paul, the twin cities. Mm -hmm. So is he right? Well, he th I think he is. I mean, you know, only Minnesota, I think, is a great campaign for tourism. But uh, I think we do ourselves a disservice by 
conveying the idea to others that we're all about cabins and canoes, and it's always summer here. This is back to the video. endless, endless <laughs> the debate over the video. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think the issue different is, objective. Yeah, no, and I and I totally understand. I think what you did was right for what you were asked to do, but I do think that we have to. We, I mean, there's several things that are odd about this. First of all. You know, when you're from uh, Boston, you don't say I'm from Massachusetts, you say you're from Boston, but we say we're from Minnesota. So we're constantly conveying this idea that one, we're a rural state, which we're not. We're actually an urban state. The majority of the population of the state lives in Didn't cities. Didn't you say, what, three of five? Well, we're about, the metro area is about three million out of a state of about five some. So, and then you add Rochester, Duluth, and actually it's a sizable percentage of our population are urbanites, right? But we don't present ourselves that way, which I think is a problem, maybe not for tourism, but it's definitely a problem for recruiting people here. And, um, and I also think that we tend to uh, ignore the fact that it's cold and we have winter here, which I think is a huge mistake. I think what's great about what Eric has started <laughs> is that we need to actually recognize that that is a tremendous advantage for us. I mean, when you look at the index of uh, countries in terms of innovation of the top 20 17 of the top 20 are cold countries. This is really interesting. So can you go through, can you yeah, take I off mean, some of the, well, some of the states. So it's Switzerland, Sweden, <laughs> Finland, Netherlands, Denmark, and the United States is in there at number six. Uh, but what about cities? You also mentioned cities that are the most innovative. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, and they, they tend, Florida's, uh, I mean, in, when uh, Florida looks at the creative class, we're usually in the top 10. I mean, in his map here, it's New York, Washington, Boston, Atlanta, Chicago, Minneapolis, Denver, San Diego, San Francisco, and Seattle. So, uh, uh, interestingly, sure. not, not Los Angeles, for example. I mean, there's some really obvious m missing cities in here. So size isn't the issue. The issue is innovation. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I think that um, I, I, what I would love for us to do is to recognize that we have a different kind of challenge here, which actually Greater MSP, which had its annual meeting the other day, said that we all say that it's hard to get people to come here and then they never want to leave, and it turns out that the research shows that's true. Yeah. But we have a real problem of getting to get people to move here. So your point, and I want to broaden it out, is it is cold. Yes, hello, it's freezing, yeah. but embrace it. <laughs> totally. Enjoy, Eric made a good point in the Star Tribune article saying, I think it was Eric, that they're, that they're in Stockholm, there are outdoor cafes year-round. And people are bundled up, and it's sort of cool, romantic thing. I mean, why don't we have that? So embrace it more than we do? Absolutely. I mean, I was in Copenhagen last week, right? 60% of the population commutes by bikes, and it was cold and drizzly. It was a freezing rain. That didn't stop them. I mean, they just go. And, you know, so these, these northern capitals, which are centers of innovation, have embraced it. And we seem to be apologetic about it. And I don't think we're ever going to succeed because people know that we're cold. We should... We should own it. <laughs> yeah, and I think we try to celebrate it with the Lopet and with some of the other activities that go around. We I mean, do that. And, and that's again, good. if it's cold, you want to create. You want but to I do would, something. Do we have a tourism? We should do one that's just about winter. We have a winter campaign. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> have we seen it yet? Is it no, out No, it's not here tonight. I mean, nobody wants to live in a place where they feel like, oh, it's great for seven months, and then the other five you have to right. hide inside. Exactly. I mean, the Lopet, I think, is one of our proudest mm -hmm. moments Absolutely. of the year. Pond I to see it, and, and it's just amazing. Well, that was the original tourist um, you know, imp impetus, because St. Paul Paul, which was one of the fastest growing cities in the 1800s in the United States, created the um, winter festival, winter carnival, right. and then created the ice palaces. And it was all about embracing and the cold. And it was a very different kind of approach and fairly successful. They were competing with Montreal, which had a smallpox epidemic, which <laughs> <laughs> it was a little unfair, totally but unfair. <laughs> unfair. Hey. But they did succeed eventually. My grandfather was <laughs> Volcanus Rex back in the day, too. I but again, it was that pride that people just brought people out to celebrate um, the elements, and I, they were proud of it. I'm pulling this up to read because the um, chief marketing officer here at, at the Walker, their neighbor, <laughs> was very vocal. They can't be here tonight, but they sent um, a long email, which Andrew forwarded to me, about their thoughts on this conversation. And I felt like it was such a long email and so committed to the discussion that I have to read part of it. And it has part of what, what, what we're talking about. So they wrote, um, you, quote, you have to be a certain sort of person to show up in a place like Minnesota talking about the pioneers, with nothing more than a bag of corn and a spoon. And the only thing that separates you from here and the hereafter is a blanket. 
Maybe your strength isn't ornamental, but people would be seriously foolish to underestimate just how strong you have to be to endure a place like this, especially during pioneer times. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> that <was there. laughs> so that really struck me. So, okay, we can all say it here. We know it's great. We live here. I'm from here. How, from a marketing, branding perspective, how do we translate that to the masses? You know, for, for years, I had to recruit here, people here, creative people, to this, to this market. And I actually, you know, I didn't, I dealt with the cold. I said, this is what it is. But, you know, Tom, I thought, made a really interesting point when you talked about we define ourselves as Minnesota instead of Minneapolis. I, with the people I was recruiting, had to focus, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but on the cities and on how creative and how much there was, was here. Right. And, and that was my focus. And I was often recruiting people from San Francisco or New York or London or in these very sophisticated cities. And there was this perception that it was the land of cabins and, yeah. and Eskimos. And I said, no. And, and the worst not. thing in the global economy when we're competing with cities around the globe is to look like every other city. Actually, the quirkier you are, the more successful you will be. Right. And so if we are the winter American city, we, that is how we'll succeed. Not trying to look like it's summertime here all the time. But <laughs> summer is great here. I had no question. But it nevertheless, it's the quirkiness that will s help us succeed. We need to be different from all the others, not trying to look like them. Yeah, and I also think we need to raise the conversation because I don't think anyone really talks about Minnesota or Minneapolis. And I think about right. the millennial generation. And by 2020, they're going to be 40% of the workforce. Wow. And um, we really have to inspire them to come to Minnesota to work because mm -hmm. I think all of us want to have a great workforce. But then I go, okay, if they're purpose-driven, purpose how do we do that? And then I think about... Only in Minnesota will you find so many companies dedicated to feeding the planet or yeah. providing more water for right. the world. So there's very purpose-driven organizations that are here that I think if you did a ranking, right. other cities can't even compete, right. but no one knows it. So how do we get that message out that only in Minnesota these opportunities and unique business opportunities are here for the, that next generation? Right. We have a huge humanitarian population. The reason we have so many Hmong and Somalis and other diversifying population is we've got a very strong humanitarian nonprofit sector, which I think goes to this issue of purpose. Yes. Right. Um, I think I gave a, a talk this morning in Atlanta uh, to a group of women in finance, and, um, and, and it was about the, my generation. I'm on the cusp. I'm on the old cusp of millennials. And it was about how I believe that uh, my generation wants businesses to stand more for stand for more than just the bottom line. That I I, tru I truly believe they want the, uh, companies to as much as they can take a stance on something very controversial issues, a uh, gay marriage, gun control. You've seen Starbucks, a company, come out vocally on that. You've seen other companies come out. Um, Sam's Club, the CEO of Sam's Club is a fascinating woman named Rosalind Brewer, the first African-American woman to run any division of Walmart. And she talked to me about how social media and millennials are completely, completely changing the game for them. So, so they're, they are, I think our generation definitely wants more from the companies they work for and the companies they buy for. And this gets back to wanting to know where their, where their products are from. But on, on that point, we have this great thing happening here, and that is that Minnesota is finally becoming a lot more diverse. Um, the largest Somali population outside of Somalia, the second largest now among population. Behind L.A. Out, out, right, exactly, behind L.A. now. Um, so I guess to you, Christine, I know you have some statistics on that you can talk about, but also do you think that we are embracing that enough to add, add to what we have to offer as a state? Yeah, it's interesting because I think a lot of the people that have immigrated to Minnesota come for a better life, and the lifestyle is definitely here. I grew up in St. Paul, and I'm happy to say now I love walking down the streets of if it's St. Paul or Minneapolis, and it's a much um, more diverse world. However, we're only 17 percent representative of minorities, whereas that uh, you know national average is 30. So we still have a long way to go, and I think if we're lucky enough to uh, recruit um, and attract diverse um, and minority. Um, populations, it's really retaining them. 
because there's this weird social bubble. So if they come here, they really have to feel that they're part of the community. And I think that's something else that was talked about at the greater MSP annual meeting as well. It's like once we get them here, um, they love it, but really making sure that this, this feels like their community. And I think you've seen an evolution over the last two decades of broader communities, more accepting communities, but it's just a better place to live too. Um, but what about, what about to you, Bruce, um, you know, when I reported on Barkat Abdi, the actor mm -hmm. from the Somali community, I, I went to this amazing Somali mall in yes. yeah. Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I never went, had been there. I grew up like two miles from there. I never went there until I did this story. Why? 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 You know, and, and I think how can we better integrate that into our businesses and what we do so that it's not just, because these are communities that often stay within in the familiar familiarity within their, you know, and you see it in New York too. Mm -hmm. You see it in Chinatown, certain parts of New York, Queens, Brooklyn, et cetera. But if, if we have all of this diversity that is, so how do we better integrate it? Well, I, you know, we're just becoming more urban. Again, speaking about the metro area, I mean, if you look at the explosion of, of where millennials choose to live and the transportation that they choose to use, we're, we're all coming closer together. A shared we're, economy. We're becoming a shared economy, and it's less about, you know, making it and moving out to the suburbs. It's about moving back to the city. So I think just by how, you know, the city is, development is changing and how we're living and apartments are booming up everywhere, that we're, we're coming back and we're getting closer, and it has to become more diverse. It's hard to... You can't just walk past it. It's easy if you're living way out in the in the edge of the city to you're right. You to drive from it. your garage to your garage at work. Absolutely, but go to your familiar you know, restaurant. We're look at the the green, you know, the the midtown greenery, you know, and how the explosion of urban development that's had, and and what light rail is doing. We're just we're becoming much more of a melting. Well, it's pot. kind of like a resegregation, though. I think technically, like the, uh, you know, in the first wave of immigration, like historically, it's urban based, mm -hmm. and the second waves and third waves tend to be suburban based, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that people don't realize that the suburbs are actually highly diversified, mm -hmm. and and that's creating problems within their tax bases and stuff. And the urban core is being, you know, uh, it's largely white retirees it's highly gentrified so you're getting this inversion happening and that's true I think in, in Minneapolis mm -hmm. I don't know about st. Paul but Minneapolis definitely has those statistics where if you go out to the first ring because you know the houses are larger the family the family congregation patterns are different mm -hmm. they need larger structures and it's cheaper and so there's all of these factors driving it, which then the suburbs will have to deal with in a different way than they're used to. They're well, used to I think another piece of this, so uh, the Metropolitan Council did this report, Thrive 2040, I think is what it was called, and they said that most of the growth in population for this, this region in the future will be internationals. Mm -hmm. That we are almost done getting people <laughs> off the plains, that nobody's left on the farms anymore, you know? We've kind of no emptied, they've kind us. of emptied out the, no the rural left. areas. And that, so, you know, we're getting people coming here from all over the world, many of them coming from cities. Uh, and they're very well educated, and they expect urbanism of the sort that we haven't had. Yeah, we should probably tell people, like, the urbanization phenomenon globally yeah, I mean that's that's clearly the you know the century's trend mark. So like seventy five percent of the world's population lives in urban centers why now. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's that's the big. Do we know shift. why? Do we know why? Uh, it's just the f the same fact. I think it's economic. The same set of actually, and there are a lot of economics work. driving this, both you know in, in poorer countries as well as in developed countries. I mean, you know, we're in the midst of a third industrial revolution right now. You're writing about this. Yeah, and this is what's drawing. In your ninth people. book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah done. And uh, and it's drawing people back into cities. Uh, so even though we have this technology that allows us to live anywhere, we actually are choosing to live closer together. I would assume energy prices too. There are many reasons. For it. Yeah. It's, it's also a quality of life, which right. is something that, that I think Minnesota, Minneapolis, well, Twin Cities should claim credit for because the stuff that Richard Florida talks about in all of his books since he started was this idea of investing in, in culture and place, right, place making. But Minnesota started this in the 1950s with the corporate executives. So they were out, um, you know, basically hounding each other, saying that you have to invest in the community in order for in order to attract people, because they were dealing with, it's cold here. How do I grow my Fortune 500 company? Still dealing with and they invested in culture. They invested in the, the environment. They invested in all of these things that people share in the public realm. And that's what gi gives Minnesota the clear advantage. 
it's not it's unclear though whether that will simply continue mm. right because that trend is very different now when companies can pick up stakes and move relocate so easily so that's the thing that the state risk is that the companies will like de-invest in these common in, in the common core the commons of what makes living here um, why do you th why do you, right. why do you think that's a risk why do you think they would do that um, well, there's uh, well, there's all sorts of tax dodging strategies. <laughs> I'm sure CNN has covered. <laughs> <laughs> there's a good one called Double Dutch. Fully. Look it up, and it's like just <laughs> exporting money and importing. It's just phenomenal. Like how people. This is this is why Switzerland's number one on the list for financial innovation <laughs> for tax for tax dodging. But um, <laughs> but uh, you know like. So it, because, simply, simply bottom line driven is what you're saying. Well, you know, uh, companies do need skilled labor, and so the, the Minnesota still ranks very high in, in college educations and uh, completion of high school. And, you know, it has very high marks in certain areas, and that's what has traditionally made it stand out and compete well. Right. They're never going to compete with, like, Mississippi and Alabama, which are basically just giving money to companies to open up shop in their states. That's a bad long-term strategy, personally, I think, sure. from a governance standpoint. So, so how do you begin to compete? And you have to really um, look at the workforce. And, and there's more trends towards that, that, that people want a more satisfied workforce. And so there has to be more quality of life issues. Like I joke with people to convince them here, like, well, you can actually send your kids to public school. To and that's a big that's deal. A, I mean, <laughs> that doesn't apply really? in a lot of that's states. A it's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. I use that constantly yeah, recruiting absolutely. people. And, and there's so many it's cities where deal. you can't, you can't do, that. do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would argue, t too, going back, you mentioned the 1950s as when mm -hmm. we started to see this. I would go back to much earlier mm -hmm. than that. The fact that you know, this area, both the, of our major cities, had the vision to build parks and to invest in yeah. public structures. Right. That right. really matters, and that that foundation has made us what we are. So active, yeah. I think in the latest survey of 2013, we ranked the fourth, uh, basically best, happiest, healthiest place to live, looking at not only physical health, uh, mental health, uh, d happiness in your job. Minnesota mm -hmm. was four. Yeah. Right. You know, so. And we're the third state. I mean, it's Hawaii, Colorado, then Minnesota. And, <laughs> right. uh, and then the happiest cities, I think it's, it's interesting. St. Paul is number, what is St. Paul number eight? Uh, eight and Minneapolis is 14. So <laughs> you're a little happier. In <laughs> <laughs> but so this is across many cities. I mean, this is a. You also, many you also pointed out that a statistic that Minneapolis or Minnesota, was it Minneapolis or Minnesota, has the biggest gap in terms of income and cost of living? Yeah, I mean, that was a recent uh, study which shows that we have high, high salaries proportional to other cities in terms of cost of living. We have the best gap of any major city, which you know, on the good side, in other words, salaries are high and it's relatively inexpensive to live here compared to other cities we compete with, which so, is a great thing. Good quality of life. Yeah. So, so okay, we're great at a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Christine, what are we not great at? <laughs> Telling our story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, we're trying to get the word out to why you should come here for a vacation or why, if you are from here, why you should explore different corners of the state. But I think from an economic level, just letting people know, you know, only in Minnesota can you find, um, again, I'm inspired because we are feeding the planet. And um, by the, Cargill, the year 2050, uh, there'll be 9 billion Land people on this planet. We have to double our food consumption. So General Mills, Cargill, Land O'Lakes, um, and the list goes on. This is probably the largest concentration of innovative food companies that are feeding this planet. When you think about water, there's going to be a severe water um, issue, and there already are in many parts of the world. You, you have people fighting over religion and land now. People, mm -hmm. fast forward 10 or 20 years from now, are going to be fighting over the basics, food and water. And here, in terms of uh, water, you have Pantera. You have Ecolab. You have GE. So a lot of very innovative companies. But again... Who knows that? And right. especially, I mean, if you live in this community, you know that, and you're proud of that. But we have to get that story out to a more global economy. Well, that's the future economy. branding campaign, right? Like, water will be the new oil. Mm -hmm. So if you start, like, start now. <laughs> yeah. You know, Texas, who cares, yeah. right? No. I mean, it, right. it'll be like. <laughs> but again, if I'm a millennial, I really care about these right. issues. These are issues for the planet. Right. Yeah, and I think that this is why the coldness is actually an advantage. Because in a way, I mean, it, as our history shows, we've been in. Innovators. So we're not just big in these areas, we're big because we've been an innovative Correct. culture. 
And I, I think we're innovative in part because we're at a place where there's a lot of adversity. I mean, it's tough living here. And, uh, but I think we should say, look at, you know, if you're really tough to do this, you can live here and you can make all of this happen. Should we have like a toughness competition? Yes. Yeah. Like, no, no wusses like, allowed. Drive broadcast on CNN. Yeah, if you're a wuss, stay out. <laughs> Um, uh, well, it's kind of like if you can make it here, you can make it yeah. anywhere. New York says that. I think we need to come up with our version of that from yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Good idea. I think you, you know if you talk about perseverance and, and right. it's tough here. I go back too to the roots of the city is mm -hmm. built on creativity. Right. If you look at flour milling, if you look at that, instead of just shipping agricultural products, we turn them into something. Right. All of our Fortune 500 companies here are defined by creativity. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, it's defined, creativity is like the Walker Arts Center or the architecture right. department. Yeah. No, no, it's about everything that we make here. 3M is about creativity. Mm -hmm. Target is about creativity. Mm -hmm. right. um, food processing. Right. Healthcare. Mm -hmm. The mail Healthcare's clinic. huge. Right. Well, there's innovation in every sector, in right? Everything. You'll see it in retail, you'll see it in culture, you'll see it in every part of the economy. So the question is, how do you then how do you build that? And also another thing is we haven't really talked about it's just not the twin cities, it's also regionally. So regionalism is the new thing. Like states are basically like, you know, they're antiquities, I think, <laughs> and just in the kind of framework that they have because, uh, you know, cities right. propel a certain level of influence, right? And that's but, what Tom has been doing. But this idea of regionalism within the state is the other kind of core component. It's like, so how do you think about Rochester, the southern mm -hmm. part of Minnesota? Where do you, how do you think about the Twin Cities? How do you think about the northern mm -hmm. part? And they each have different um, different um, attributes, right? So we know we've heard a lot about Rochester because of the Mayo Clinic trying to become, you know, you know a spot for health tourism, basically, and a whole new genre of like, you yes. know, I'll take my surgery and I'll shop and. But it already, it already is. <laughs> Go to a we casino, like I guess. I don't know what they're doing, but um, but that's a whole new important <laughs> element um, to it. So each region can have its own within a state or across the states too. Of course, I, we know this, right? Like I, Wisconsin is really a part of Minnesota. When is you it? think about this, like I the western part. Well, part of it. Yeah, is. yeah, the metro area. There's another like, part that's part of Chicago. Really? Yeah, the right. southern yeah. part, but I the mean, part near. You know, know I mean, near, I think, uh, you know, part of this is defining, you know, what are we the capital of? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, again, is Eric's idea of, you know, we're, we should declare the capital of the north. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago has claimed the Midwest, and I think we all know that we're, there's some distinctive cultural differences between so, the Midwest so, and here. So that poll in the Star Tribune article that yeah. polled a bunch of different names, the Midwest did not do well right. for, for how we define Right, Minnesota, and there, and some people liked the North, other people liked a few other names. But I agree, we should have our own identity. But at the same time, the question becomes, why? And should Minnesota stand alone, or should Minnesota be? Can other states join on if they, if we are the North, if that's what we go with? However, you know this happens, right? Should other states should other states come along, or yeah. do we just want to be by it's ourselves? It's not just it's a region. Minnesota. It's a region. Yeah. I mean, we need to declare, take the whole upper tier of the United States and claim it as ours, and we're the capital. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and we're the capital. I like that. That's true. I yeah, mean, yeah. it's actually You'll be true. The center of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, Chicago yeah. draws actually more from the south. Very few people right. Uh, right. come. You know, we draw from that whole northern tier of states. Uh, they we're don't go to Chicago. We are running out of people. <laughs> now we're going overseas to bring them here, which is fine, you know. But, you know, we should be the mecca for talented, creative, innovative people. And, you know, we've got the culture, the history to do this. We've got the climate, you know. It's cold here. You've got to work. You've got to try. We've got things. the great housing downtown. We've got all of this kind of infrastructure, in but we haven't done a good job telling a new kind of narrative about ourselves. But how do you do that when you're recruiting uh, Christine, when you're recruiting, when when all of you guys are recruiting, um, is it still an uphill battle? It is, and again, I, I'm recruiting for the advertising profession, but I talk very little about the advertising profession. Yeah. What they want to know is the quality of life. Right. They want to know what they're going to do there. They want to know why it's going to be purposeful to, to move from New York or San Francisco. So it really becomes selling the, the business community, the Fortune 500 companies, the parks, the Beer, James Beard Award winning restaurants. It's culture. The whole, culture, it's yeah. the whole package, right. and right. healthcare. So yeah. I don't really... I. Fallon is a huge um, anchor for, I think, this marketplace and a lot of the other agencies and creative communities in the Walker. Um, but it's also the lifestyle. 
And we have a lot to offer, and I would love to find a platform that unites us, whether it, it's North or something else. North I like because you can say that's we're the capital. I like that. But I still <laughs> think Minnesota has a unique story, so I don't necessarily want to group that with everybody else because I think we are unique, and that story has to be told not through it necessarily an advertising campaign, but from the people that live here and from the, com um, the companies that are part of this unique community. Because um, I think that's going to be more authentic and more believable. So it, you can do that when you can get your recruits here, right? If you're that interested in them that you're flying them in for an interview, et cetera. But how about just getting them to apply in general, right? Have, you, have, have any of you faced or realized that some of the people that we want aren't applying because they think, oh, Minnesota, it's cold. I'm not sure that's where I want to be. Do, you, do we face that challenge? Yeah, do it's we know? also flyover country. So yes, it's cold, but they don't, you go Minnesota and it's usually blank. <laughs> or it's cold. Um, but I see that as a huge opportunity. Right, so we have again, to right. change that narrative. Exactly. I think, I think for us, it's like, uh, it's closing the deal is the cold issue. It's not getting the applicants. Because, uh, you know, we purposely tried to bring the walker to an international stage. Mm -hmm. so we're one of the, I think we're the largest cultural exporter in, in Minnesota, um, meeting the tours and productions go all over the world. So people don't have a problem applying. It's just getting them sign the deal, right? So it's like, well, I hear it's really cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can't really lie. Bad. It's like, oh no, that's completely lies, lies. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're stopping that. We're right. stopping that. That's we're right. embracing like, this. They talk about snow, and I say, oh no, that's buffalo. And then that is buffalo. <laughs> that is buffalo. It is buffalo because it's on the edge of the lake, and then today. it gets all the lake affected. Where is all the snow today in Buffalo? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Not no, it's not. It's not always here. So it's kind of closing the deal. But I think I think one of the conundrums is it the state? Is it the cities? Is it you know like because it's a, from a branding standpoint, it would be about positioning. So like, what are you trying to tell me then, Minnesota? Because it is this interesting thing that it's more about the state than it is the place. Like in other cities, like in Boston, yes, it's about being in Boston. Like any other place doesn't really particularly matter. Well, maybe Cambridge for different reasons. But <laughs> and that's intercity rivalries like city. But I do think Paul. that it has to go beyond branding. I think we have to have the substance to back no, it no, up. No, no, no. I mean, know? that's part of the logic of branding. That's like, so, okay, so what are your differentiating qualities and what are you trying to position? Are you trying to position the state or are you trying to position a city? And that's different because it what would lead you to different what things. What should we position? I think you should be positioning the cities because I think this is the global trend. It's all about cities right, it and it's is. competition from cities to cities. The state has an important infrastructural backbone, but it's really competition among cities. And we can see this driving right. the issues from almost globally, almost every country you can imagine. It's like a, maybe a competition amongst cities. But we should say that Minneapolis should be the Twin Cities, whatever, what? should be a cosmopolitan city, the way Toronto <gasps> declared that. But part of right? what is so great about being here being raised here was that every weekend we drove four hours north to Walker, sure. Minnesota and listened to Lake Wobegon and that was such a such an important part of my it's true. Yeah. Yeah. but oh. what I would it's, I, yeah. you know I when we have kids I I, th I think we're staying in Brooklyn. I don't know if we're coming back, but I, I think about, oh, but that's what I can't do if I'm not in Minnesota. I, it's I, unique, so right. we can't forget about what's outside sure. the cities. I've played both sides of it, because <laughs> in advertising, I had to recruit these big city people to come and realize that this, this too, is a big city. But, but now I'm wearing another hat, and in our little town of Faribault, I've got, I've got a couple of fashion designers who've been capped. Uh, camped out at the mill for 10 weeks and we can't get rid of them. They just love it. And, and they, they're coming. It's because you're in. They're well, yes, they're, because you're they, in. They love what we do, but they love the community and they're out and they're, they, they love the su southern Minnesota and they're out exploring and they're going, this is genuine. And they're both from New York. Um, you know, Duluth has recently been won totally. an award for being for right. the outside magazine. Sure. It's the great place to live so and they're pivoting to to the recreational angle right yeah, which right. makes sense for what for what their markets will bear so it's the same it's the, i know what you're saying but i, I still think it's it, like it needs to be defined like in terms of a strategy we need to send right? you like to a lake with no cell phone no it's just like helsinki <laughs> right like the Finns all have their lake cabins yeah. too yeah but they right. you know they're selling helsinki they're not selling the right, little, right, right. little cabin where but they get do, drunk on the weekend but the thing about lakes not. <laughs> but but when I was selling, what they do, you know? when I was selling the city, it was again, it was all this culture, the restaurants, the right. you know, all of this this in the city and this metropolitan thing. But on the weekend, if you want to, 
45 minutes away, it's a different world. Well, it's like, Florida, it's well, like the North Shore. I love the North Shore. That's where I vacation. It's, it's absolutely spectacular, but I have to describe it to people. I was like, well, it's rocky like Maine or like Oregon. And like they know those references, but they don't know the North Shore. Well, you know, when Florida looks at what detracts the creative class, access to nature is one of those factors, but it's only right. one. And the others are things like housing, transportation options, mm -hmm. uh, social inclusiveness, you know, career opportunities, and we put so much emphasis on this access to nature. And in fact, I think we portray ourselves as being a little bit hick. And, uh, you know, and I just don't think that's true, but that's the narrative. Is there something wrong with that? Yes, there is something. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I have to say there's something. If we're going to compete, not just with San Francisco and Seattle, but for cities around the world, that's a problem. That's a problem for yeah. us, and I, I, because it's also not true, and that's the real problem with it, is we're a very sophisticated city that is too hesitant to talk about that, right. and we portray ourselves in very kind of old-fashioned ways. I mean, we could be the, the major city of the Third Industrial Revolution if we saw the opportunity and we took advantage of it. I mean, we've got the world's biggest 3D printing company in our Which, backyard. Who knew? Yeah, they I mean, own Makerbot. They're, they're 3D <laughs> right. printing working cars here. I mean, you know, we are, we, are, we are out ahead of other cities, and we don't even know it, and we right. certainly are not talking about it, yeah. and that is a big mistake. But also, if we focus so much on the city, do we betray the rural aspects that also make Minnesota so unique and important? I don't think so. I mean, I think that, you know. I think, Tom, what you're saying is let's not be aw shucks. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, again, you can have a cosmopolitan um, tourism experience, too. If you go on exploreminnesota.com, you can have your hick vacation, sure. as you like to call it, or yeah. you can have a very cosmopolitan. Sure. Um, but again, if I am looking to change my life and move to a new community, where do I go? How do I, where do I right. go to find out more about Minnesota? I get it if I want to take a vacation there. Right. Um, but then do I go to the Chamber of Commerce or do I go to what, I think this movement is where all do, about. Exactly. Where, That's, where do people go? Well, Greater MSP just announced they've got a Make It MSP campaign. I think they're starting, but you're right. But this I don't, is, I wouldn't, I'm from here and I didn't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, know that. I mean, you know, I think this is an issue for us. Well, this an is, opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's an opportunity. Huge opportunity. Yeah. Oh, an go. issue, but, an opportunity. No, but I go back to, again, Explore Minnesota. Yes, there's a foundational campaign and an idea of unique, authentic experiences, but it ignites the community to tell that story. So a lot of the content that's created is not by Call McVoy. It's about the people here that are really saying this is why this place is such an awesome place to come vacation. But I think the business component, which is not the objective of that campaign, right. needs to be a larger part of that conversation. Right. I agree. So I want to open it up for questions in a, in a few, so please think of things. Um, so in the next few years, the Super Bowl is coming here. Mm -hmm. The Ryder Cup is coming here. The Final Four is coming here. This is in whether you like it or not or think it's a good use of taxpayer dollars. You can debate that somewhere else, but it's happening. And the question is, isn't this, Christina, a huge opportunity for us to show people that have never come here, might never come here again, what, what we are? Absolutely. I mean, the world is going to be tuning in. So again, if you think about the Super Bowl, yes, it's going to be cold, it's going to be winter. But what I loved about the people that created the campaign and the initiative to come here, they're like, we are bold. We are bold people. So we're going to celebrate everything that's wonderful about winter and Minnesota rather than hide from it. So I think there's a lot of stuff to come from that. But then again, you think about the Ryder Cup, it's going to be beautiful and sunny. So everyone who's going to tune in for that is going to go, wait. I thought it was just snow and cold. It's much more than that. Right. So it gives us a platform to dimensionalize the various seasons and the various aspects culturally and corporately that exist in Minnesota. Is that going to solve our identity crisis? No. But I see it as a huge marketing opportunity for, for the state of Minnesota. Do we have an identity crisis? Oh, uh, well, yeah. I think it's why we're here. <laughs> crisis? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean, I think crisis in the sense that we're co constantly competing with other cities, mm -hmm. and we have to recognize that that is the issue. We have to benchmark ourselves against Denver and Seattle and Portland and San Diego, which are actually probably our main competitor cities. Right. Yeah. And uh, they're doing stuff. They're, they're moving. Yeah. And if we can't just sort of assume that it's okay. And by 2020, we're going to have a shortage of 100,000 Right qualified professionals. Right. So again, it doesn't always have to come back to business, but I go, we have to start inspiring people to come here to live, um, and obviously to explore in the tourism aspects of well, it, but to live. This is what Canada did brilliantly. It's even colder up there. <laughs> 
And they just, you know, they had huge acreage to fill with people. I mean, so they, they were, you know, this is decades ago, they started a very pro-immigration policy. What do we talk about in this country? Keep everyone out. Mm -hmm. It's like, right. no. This is changing. This more. is all changing. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of old right. white people in Minnesota in the future. So to that. That's, to the, that's the headline, to, right? So. Go ahead. <laughs> I like your headlines. <laughs> I didn't say anything. You're walking away, and I felt He's like making you had, a gesture. had this urge. <laughs> um, it, before I do open it up, I do wonder on this point, I don't want to get into a huge political debate, but uh, government-wise, whether it's hyper-local, statewide, et cetera, are there things that could be done on a government level that you think would make a, a meaningful uh, material difference? Well, I mean, I think um, a lot of this innovation conversation is a bipartisan issue. I mean, you can play it on the left or the right. I mean, we all want a thriving economy and, you know, th thriving uh, communities. And so I think that, um, you know, part of this is just, um, to me, the, the biggest issue is we're so used to looking at our big Fortune 500 companies here, which are great, but we're, we've not looked at the incredible creative entrepreneurial uh, culture, mm -hmm. which is all over the place in this city and are completely below the radar screen. That's and, right. um, and I think we need to do, uh, through government public policies, uh, cultivate that. Because that is the new economy that's being born right now. And, um, and I think we have an advantage here. Uh, but we need, you know, policies to that, that foster, foster that. This is like smart manufacturing, right? Like yeah. there's plenty of states competing for, uh, you know. The, the like, big companies. Yeah, manual right. skilled labor. Right. But like smart manufacturing requires a different kind of skill set. Exactly. And, and you have a really educated workforce. So I think the hardest part about government is just mobilizing to anticipate the future, right? Because right? they're often dealing with just the present. So maybe Minnesota is always exceptional, right? So maybe they can help lead governments and, and other entities, municipalities and state it's, governments yeah. to think about it. It's just like your question, like, why don't I know that? But it's incredibly difficult to put together a site because you know how, how it will work. It'll be like, well, you know, this small town wants in there and this one, and then pretty soon it's like nothing. And so it's, it requires a level of brutality <laughs> that the marketplace, the commercial marketplace, is fully well, engaged like a in. Corporation. And yes, right, and, exactly. and, and we're not in a bad way, but in right. a differentiating way, and to say that it can't be just everything, because right. then you get nothing right. and, as a message. Right. And I think that's right. part of the problem. Right. And I think we don't have a crisis, we have a conundrum. Because we, we're, we don't. <laughs> We, we're expecting people to know how great we are, but we don't want to talk about it. And we don't want to make it sound like we're bragging because, well, we're, we're Minnesota. Minnesota right? nice. it's, yeah. it's amazing so this, we're here just, talking about this now. I know. I mean, this is really cathartic for all of us. Uh, exactly. <laughs> What stays in the room stays yeah. in the room. <laughs> yeah, this is not being live webcast. Yeah, we're live oh. webcasting. We are yeah. live webcasting. I mean, in terms of government investment, the easy one is transportation, but I think we're seeing it as controversial as it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, light rail, look at the development that mm -hmm. comes in. Sure. I think a, a healthy urban area is defined by people that want to live in its core. Right. And people are moving back to this core. Right. Whether that is truly diverse, as your earlier point is, is that's a good point, but you know, the midtown greenery, look, look at that investment and what yeah. kind of development that that created. So that's one area where government can make a difference, yeah. as controversial as it may be. Crisis, conundrum? So I feel like Christine's gonna say opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> say I'm gonna say opportunity along with opportunity. you. Yeah, I opportunity. agree, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Yeah. The very fact we're having this conversation is great. I mean, yes. even whatever terms we agree on or don't agree on and what to call ourselves, just having the conversation is the most important thing, and to continue it. So I want to open it up for questions. I do have a final question for everyone, but uh, let me open it up to audience questions. And we do Yay, have. Yay, we have questions. We do have Lots people with mics. Uh, we have mics. So let's come down right here to the third row up right here first, and let's go to this woman with the purple sweater second. If you could just say your name if you want, maybe what you do, where you're from. You. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ben Mentz, and I, I grew up in St. Paul, so um, I'm from here. And um, so one of the things I'm struck by, obviously, when I'm around uh, speaking with people that aren't from here, um, was something that happened. I went to um, New York over the summer to uh, meet with the Wall Street Journal, and um, 
I was like, well, I should bring a gift. So I went and bought my North cap from ASCOB, and I thought that'd be kind of a cool thing. And I handed it to the editor, and he was like, you I don't. You bought them a gift? Yeah, I brought a gift. So Minnesota nice. Right? <laughs> so, so I handed him the cap, the North cap from ASCOB, and he was like, looked at it for a second, he was like, I don't get it. And um, so I realized after talking to him for, for a few minutes that his entire worldview of Minnesota, which I've, you know, I think some of us encounter often, is <clears throat> has been shaped by the movie Fargo, mm -hmm. and which they have isn't this... even here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, it's not even. I mean, he was some like, of it's shot here, but it's not all. Right. People think it's all. You here. know, he had this impression that you know, like, oh, you're from the frozen north. You know, it's really um, like you guys pretend like you have your warm hearts, but if you're looking for the milk of human kindness, it's probably not the right place to go, right? <laughs> so I'm just curious, like, um, movies like Fargo, and and um, I'm just wondering, is that a good branding strategy for Minnesota? Is, is that where we should, um, you know, focus our energy and maybe murder, more movies right? that send a different message rather than you know we're this place where we're breaking the rules and maybe taking things a little too we far. We need more so. modern movies. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies, but I'll answer it. No. Yeah. <laughs> Probably doesn't help us. Well, but we can't do anything about it. No. Yeah, that's not branded. Right. That's just part right. of the, you know, so the stuff you have to deal with. Right? You could do that. You could write a movie about Minnesota. You or could. that's based in Minnesota. No, I meant you can't do anything about not sure. having those yeah. movies. Oh, right, 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 right. Brand. Yeah. That's part of the fabric. Exists, but yeah. you're right, you can. Have the Coen brothers shot any movies here? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. A yeah. lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Serious. And do you think people know they're from Minnesota? No, I don't. I don't know. Did you take the job at the journal? No, it wasn't an inter It was a media interview. Oh, you were an interviewing him. Interview. Okay. Did Did he get it ever at the yeah, end? No. Of so he got. He actually sent me a picture. Of oh, good. <laughs> 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 I'm glad to hear it. Next question, right here, uh, right there. Hi there. I'm Lisa. I'm. Uh, I do. I did the brand development for Two Gingers Whiskey. Cool. Which was a a fine. <laughs> Um, now a national brand, but originated here. Um, the interesting thing to me is that there is a, a, an easy way to reconcile this debate you're having. I think that because people are grounded and because there were the four-hour cabin trips, that that's what creates the culture for the freedom. It's almost like choosing, as I did, the least neurotic partner that you could have so that you are free to create. So the grounding and the idea of being somewhere where you're completely peaceful, maybe a little bit of nature, maybe some other elements that make this a non-neurotic partner to live in Minnesota, really creates a good fertile ground for creativity. Mm -hmm. That's my reconciliation of this debate. But Tom, the question that I'm, maybe for you, maybe for anyone, is how do you talk to millennials in a way, because now we're doing a, a building in Northeast that does food production, Red Table Meats, you may have read about, and some cool. other food branding um, in a local, regional, perhaps, to Minnesota area. Mm -hmm. um, how do you talk to millennials in a way that the cause marketing, as corporate environments call it, is actually meaningful? And so that it actually is, wh what does the research show that is the most remarkable way to actually have authenticity um, beyond being able to tour a facility where you know where your food comes from, which is what we're creating in Northeast, like a Willy Wonka of food production so that transparency, which is highly valued by the millennials, is there. But what, what do you think is the most meaningful way to actually have authenticity with your brand? So well, that and, it's and Bruce could just obviously uh, respond as well. But, you know, millennials, I mean, our students, they spend a lot of time with students, right? And they are intensely a networking generation. And they're looking for authenticity. But they're looking for uh, connecting things that seem disconnected. I mean, you know, the older generations have sort of separated everything into neat packages. And younger people now, working in a kind of a web-like way, want everything connected in as many hybrid and unusual kinds of connections as possible. So the city and the, the products or whatever that mixes it up as much as possible will have uh, a much greater appeal uh, in that regard. You know, one of the other things about this, this kind of purposeful way in which we go, we act here, that I tell my colleagues, because I came from the neurotic East Coast to, to here, and uh, is that, you know, it, it's a tough climate and it builds community because when somebody's stuck in the snow, people stop and push them out. You know, it doesn't happen in the East Coast. You know, you just drive by. And so it's, it's true. I mean, and, and so actually, this, the, the, the severity of this place 
gets people to sort of cooperate. And I think that that idea, we're in a new economy that some have called the collaborative economy, the mm -hmm. sharing economy, right? And so you want to go to a place where people know how to collaborate and know how to share. And I think that's part of our narrative, which is actually because of our climate, we're pretty good at that. We're probably better than most of the parts of the country. We have to tell that story, and I think it'll have an enormous appeal to the millennials. So let me ask, I'll finish. <laughs> What's the role of the university and the other educational institutions here in terms of attracting and retaining Got it. millennials? Role of the university. Well, I mean, again, you know, uh, all of our colleges and universities are huge uh, recruiters for talent. And, uh, but we've invested, and we need to continue to invest in that. I mean, education is key to this. But it needs to be invested in. And so right. when you have uh, de-investment of the university system, which you've experienced here over the right. last decade, then you can't expect the dividend to return. And so I think right. that's the hard part. Yeah. analysis that has to be taken up. It's like, you know, where is the tax dollars going and, and to what end? Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure Tom could testify more to that experience, but it has to be backed up. And it's a case of, to, in order to, to attract people to a climate and to a condition, geographic condition like this, there has to be investment. That's the one thing from the outsider perspective that I can tell you about the state is that the state has continuously invested in all of its all of its experiences. You know, I kind of like joke the next marketing campaign for Minnesota should be move to Minnesota and become thin, because <laughs> like after Colorado it has the least you know obesity right, and that's because there's parks and there's everyone is somewhat close to a park and there's a re recreational ethos here mm -hmm. that w would do well, and it's those kinds of strategies and that that helps solve the diversity issue. So you're, you're not not pocketed people in bubbles, right? You need some kind of common core experience. It's kind of like our version of nationalism. What would tie people together? It's a collective experience, which also taps into what you're saying about millennials, right? So these are the kinds of strategies that really need to be advanced, I think, for the state to be in the, or the city to be competitive nationally, but also internationally, globally. Right. To you, ma'am, in the purple sweater with the hat right there. Hi, I'm Suzanne Asher. I'm a book artist. Um, well, everything you've said tonight has been a lot of fun, and, and it's interesting hearing it. And I would certainly not be the young man for your canoe commercial. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a woman who went for that commercial. Like You wouldn't believe I almost cried. Um, so don't be too specific in assuming who your audience might be for what you make. But to that point, we haven't really talked about the fact that our minority populations in the state right now that have come for, quote, humanitarian reasons are not being integrated into our state in the way of perhaps this audience, this conversation. I think there should be more effort being made. We had the example of other generations where black Americans came up to here, and we weren't great in how we integrated with them. And it saddens me, coming from New York and San Francisco, that the few black friends I can have can sit here and earnestly say, I need to go out of here if I'm going to maintain my music career or my art career. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to have some talk <laughs> to that point. Thank you for the, for the thoughtful question. Um, how can we do better? Well, I mean, you know, the, the achievement gap is a real issue here. I mean, we've been very pro this region, but we've got some huge challenges, and that is one of them. And, uh, you know, particularly with so much of our growth in the future coming from around the world, uh, we have got to figure this out and figure out a way to see diversity as a tremendous advantage for us. Uh, and um, we're not there yet. Do we, is it also about all opening up within our own communities, not just our companies trying to hire more diverse, but there is this thing about Minnesota sometimes that we can get very comfortable in our communities, our neighborhoods, our friend circles, and stay right. in them? Right. That's been universal. People always say that when they move here. It's a hard place to break in, yeah. and I think that's, that's really important. Especially if you grew up here. I mean, again, you talk about St. Paul, and St. Paul, if you grew up there, I mean, you can't walk down the street without, oh, there's that cousin or there's right. that place. So if you're an outsider to come into that, you come into this community that's very insular right from the beginning. I see it opening, but we have a long way to go. Yeah, and I think we, you know, we should be using social networks to actually uh, curate relationships. When people come, we need to have ways to get people plugged in 
in whatever way they want to be plugged in. That there's the capacity to do that. And I think that you know, we just have to be much more proactive using the technology and the means we already have so that nobody feels isolated when they come here. And there is a community for everybody here. They just don't know how to get into it. And I think as a, as a region, as a community here, we could do more to make that easier. And reaching out more. And absolutely. You know. did, did, does that answer your question, or do you have a thought on what we could do better? Oh. <laughs> well, you did a great job with your question, so thank you for that. Right here with the glasses, sir. Hi, my name is Joe Huber. I'm a senior at McAllister College studying economics and geography. Congratulations. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> my question centers on regions, and regions form when perceptual and vernacular characteristics align. And everyone who lives in Seattle and Portland will agree that they live in the Pacific Northwest, and we do too. But when people can't agree what the Midwest is, and we can't even agree if we belong in the Midwest or the North, how do we align those interests? And what are the implications, specifically to Christine and Bruce, for bringing people here for tourism and also bringing people here to live and work? It's interesting that you've kind of come back to the original topic <laughs> of what we were supposed to be talking about right. here tonight. Oh, yeah. uh, and I honestly uh, don't know the answer to that. And, and I think that Eric actually had an interesting idea of actually starting a contest to, to generate some ideas around that. I think whatever it is, it has to be authentic and not kind of made up by some ad guy like I used to be. Um, I think the, the best names, I mean, Andrew cited, you know, I love New York and some of these other efforts that have worked, but most of them fail. Dismally, yeah. it's yeah. got to come from someplace because real. They, because they're not specific enough, I would right. say. You know, and and a lot of them is just um, the money's come flow through tourism, and that becomes the moniker for the state experience, right? And so you have a totally different relationship if you're moving to a state to work. I think the idea about regionalism is really interesting. I think it could take off because you're starting to see more of that. We talked a little bit about North or North Coast or, you know, like, and there is, what is the North? That was a really good point. Like, I know what the South is, at least I think I do. I lived there for a little bit. So they, they kind of disagree about some certain states that really aren't part of the South. But generally, we know what that is. But we don't, when we say the North, it is kind of this vagary. We're and, the North. But, yeah, I mean, so you should claim it, right? And and you have con you have a bit of consensus around the fact that it's not quite the Midwest. That there's something about the Midwest. Like technically, it may be true from the government's statistical standpoint, but from like right. Tom and I grew well, up in the Midwest, and we were like, no, we don't really think of it because it politically, culturally, right. it doesn't align. With it's a perceptual Midwest. misalignment right. for me. Right. So, but I think you need to have the people define what it is to keep it authentic. Yeah. And I do think I'm sorry, I am a marketer. I am a brand brand building person, we can be part of the conversation, but it has to be much more than that. Well, it'll it only back be to, successful if it is. To be successful. Right. And I think it goes back to the strategy. We can be many things. Who should decide what we should be? That should be the people of this region. What, but yeah. if you decide what you want to call it, that's only the first step. It's then what are the stories to tell and to have that come authentically from the people. Um, and hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation and it ignites the people here, but many more people to help define so, that in the future. So a very exact uh, poll I want to do now. So who raise your hand if you think that Minnesota should claim an identity, whether it's the North or something else that's different than, Mid than the Midwest. So look around. Just about everybody. So that's like seven, it's my exit yeah. poll, 75%. Yeah. So raise your hand if you don't, if we should be part of the Midwest. Okay, some. So there's a, so, so a majority of people think we should be something in and of ourselves. Now the question is, what are we going to be? And a lot more of that conversation will continue outside of this panel um, online, through Eric, et cetera. All stay involved. We will all stay involved in this. But all right, I'm excited to see what we're going to. The region choose. formerly known as the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, a few more quick questions. Can I, and then can I'll I let just, you guys one, go. one final point on that? I, I, think, <laughs> I think the thing that it, I don't want to name this, and I think that should, that's a bigger discussion, but the idea of embracing the North, I think, is a real thing, and I think it's, let's embrace and where we are, and it's different. And isn't the Super Bowl coming up? I mean, it's a ways away, but isn't that a great thing to build up to when all, so many people will be here experiencing the, the North? <laughs> Go for it. Um, question up there in the corner, sir, right there. Yep, all the way up. Hello, my name is Chris Sachs. I 
born in St. Paul, and so I've, I've been in this area my whole life. I went to Michigan for school, but came back uh, afterwards. And we're talking about how to kind of rebrand or brand it new or differently. And while we're up here and, and you guys are the leaders of the conversation, it keeps going back to, oh, it's hard here. Or, oh, well, yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be tough, you know? And even you guys are doing that. And you're trying to bring people here. Yeah. You know? But it's a good tough, no? But, well, yeah. but it's tough love. It's true. But if we're going to try to bring people here because we're having this conversation and we want to grow this region and bring this talent here, well, it's almost got to be like, yeah, it's tough here, but it's also easy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so it's true. what are yeah. the things that we need to start the conversation about that is, what is the easy stuff about being here? Yeah, yeah. You know? that is really and then, true. And then, and Affordability and then on that of note, living wanna, in a cool place. I'd like to hear from you guys, job. who are the people you think are the most effective at getting this message out? Is it mm -hmm. us? Is it mm -hmm. the companies? Is it everybody? Yeah, so I would, I'll, I, I would so. say it's everybody. I mean, you know, coming here from the East Coast, and one reason we have such a high retention rate of, of people, particularly when they have families, is it is just so much easier to live here than almost any other major city I've lived in. Uh, and so, it, it, I, you know, that means a lot for people. And, um, I mean, I, you know, my friends in New York, when I tell them, you know, when I go to the Guthrie, I mean, I sometimes I just pull right up in front of the theater, put the coins <laughs> in. Well, you know, they can't believe it, you know. Yeah. You just, like, park in front of the theater. And so, I mean, it's just, and, and so it's tough, but it's also really easy, and that's a huge selling point. Yeah. I mean, yeah. try buying an apartment See, in, in yeah, New York. Exactly. It's no, easy to find a good school for your kids. Yeah, it's it's easy, easy to right. get around. Right, it, right. That's a really good point. It's yeah. a very good point. You. Well, and we all, we all need to see this. Point, point yeah. taken. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, more Easy. questions right here in the front row. Diane. Hi, Diane Hofstad, uh, born and raised in Minneapolis. I, I want to thank all of you, Eric, uh, and all of the panelists. This is just a great discussion. My question is, What's next? How do we get the word out? And um, are there any plans for something else? Is it a competition? How do we move uh, this forward? Did you give your microphone. Eric. 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 <laughs> Eric. You're on. I don't know if I can announce. No, not. Breaking news on CNN. No, no Tune in. We'll news have it for you at some point. Just Stand keep up, watching. Eric. Stand up. OK. So you know, I, I, we, we got asked about this on, on NPR. I was on NPR with, with Tom, uh, I guess it was yesterday. And you know, we, we, we no, uh, no, and, we, and there, there isn't like a, this isn't like a master plan. I mean, this, and, and I don't think it, and I don't, I don't, I think it's best to not be. And so we're going to go grab a drink after this, after this panel and think about what could be next. And I hope you all will do the same over drinks. And I, I don't think this should be a, a top down thing. This isn't, this isn't, you know, coming from my dad's administration. This isn't coming from, <laughs> you know, I'm not, uh, this isn't, this isn't a, a secret, you know, fortune 500 company. Uh, the initiative. This, is really, <laughs> this is really just all, you know, now all of our idea, I hope. And, and I think that's what's, you know, in the past, all of these initiatives have been a top down, you know, someone came up with a tagline or someone came up with a, a new logo. And then this really is just as, as simple as, as an idea. And if, and if, if it resonates with you, then, Maybe you'll share it, and I think that's what might actually make this one stick where other, where others haven't. So uh, I'm kind of for. proud of the lack of a plan that we have at this point. But maybe there'll be more <laughs> of a plan later. So, and I, I think it is fair to say that the conversation will continue online in a certain, in a certain form, right, Eric? When we have something, you know, we, you know, right. we'll we'll continue it online. You can always email me ideas. It's easy. Poppy .harlow at CNN. Um, on social media, we're going to keep in touch, but right. the conversation definitely will will keep going. Uh, more questions, uh, sir, right there in the plaid shirt and the vest. Uh, my name is Larry Martin, and I'd like to know where. <laughs> <laughs> that description didn't oh, work. Oh, right oh, well. <laughs> we have multiple plaid shirts and vests in the audience. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. That's great. I also just got that joke. Sorry. All right. I'm Larry Martin, 
And uh, where will this webcast be available? Okay, so it's oh. streaming now. Yeah, we're live streaming now. And then um, it takes us about a day to make the edit, a day or, a day or so. So we think we'll be able to have it ready Friday afternoon. And it can be you can be found on the Walker website, walkerart.org, on the Walker channel. And we also push that out to YouTube. So if you um, maybe Google um, the title of this uh, presentation and then <laughs> you'll find the video. Which is Midwest question mark. Midwest question mark, yes. And then so you can find it on YouTube on our channel there or on the Walker channel on the website probably Friday afternoon at the earliest. Yeah, and again, I, hopefully a conversation has started tonight because yeah. I think, yeah. yes, we are panelists, but we don't have the answers. And I just want to thank Eric again for just igniting all of us because we're all proud about the state that we live in and it's just getting the story out there and told. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think one, you really want to ask a question, right? <laughs> that is like very eager. Let's go for you for the last question. Okay, well, my name is Ellen Lawson. Um, full disclosure, I started a website called theflyover.com, which is all about kind of Midwest-wide cool. um, style, um, fashion and style. So full disclosure. Neat. But um, when you talk about um, the North being culturally and politically different than the rest of the Midwest, um, I kind of don't really see that. I mean, you know, are we so politically similar to Wisconsin right now? You know, like, are we so, you know, culturally similar to South Dakota? You know, apparently more not. so than, you know, <laughs> well, more, more so than like Kansas City or, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, what if we, you know, kind of like rising tides floats all boats, like, why don't we, you know, rebrand the Midwest or, you know, because when a company rebrands, they don't always change their name completely, and you know they kind of work with what they have, but change the perception. So, you know, are there any thoughts about that? Well, I think the problem I have with the Midwest, and Eric brought this up in the NPR conversation. I mean, it's a very East Coast centric definition of us, right? Yeah, we're somewhere out there, the you know. Definition. And uh, I mean, I find that actually kind of obnoxious. In a kind of, I've spent a lot of time on the East Coast. I know how obnoxious they are. are and uh, <laughs> and sorry, sorry, Bobby. One of us still sorry, lives Bobby. there. I know, I know. <laughs> there it is. But nevertheless, it's very, it's very, you know, what like there is something beyond the Hudson River kind of attitude. So I actually think this idea that the North is claiming a part of the country that we know exists, but we never call it that, and um, and it's and it's and it's not somebody's perspective. We're not sort of Midwest. We're the North the way the South, the West, and the East exist. Yeah. And so it's more geographically honest, I think. It's not a perspective from the East Coast. Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I see that. Um, but it's also kind of, you know, like, you, you, they're never going to, you know, on Wikipedia, they're never going to redraw, you know, the lines and stuff. We can do that. We can all do that. We can all do that. Yeah. Tonight. Tonight. And I don't, I don't, Tonight. I'm not Tonight. saying it has to be the, the Midwest. New Wikipedia. But we can also change what people think of what is existing here. I feel, I feel like that's what we're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, but you don't feel like that that can change. Or, oh, I do. No, I do. Ex I, oh, I wanted to change. But she what said, people, "Don't just leave yes, it yes, to yes. Minnesota." Yeah, I'm. You know, well, when we're I, when I, we're talking about the North, all right. we're talking about is Minnesota. I mean, part of you know, the like is that is that no, not, not I mean, necessarily. No, no, I mean, no. but, but but what Tom yeah. and I were getting at is that the idea that what defines any particular territory now, and it tends to be a city-based mm -hmm. uh, hub of activity, economic activity, ex you know, cultural activity, etc. So somebody. And kind of more brutal, but somebody has to own the space, and then that's why you don't want the rest of the Midwest because it's not differentiated enough. It's definitely different than Kansas City. I can tell you that it's definitely different. Even even uh, even the closer geography. If you just go roll back the election cycles on the maps, <laughs> those beautiful maps on CNN. <laughs> we are we are very proud of. There's this. this other blue thing happening up north, and it's not in the sea of red. Okay, right. and and that is selling you something. It's right. just a fact, and. And then you can play upon these facts and you can make them destiny, I think. I think it's all easily done. 
Eric? I think the mistake is to think you can't brand it or you can't re change perceptions. I think that's a big mistake. Part of the problem with the, the name Midwest is it's too big. Right. Yeah. It's huge. And it was defined, Where does it end? as Tom said, by yeah, someone on the East Coast, it's probably. It's the middle. Yeah. Right. So Colorado, about our your map, Rocky Mountains. About our awesome maps on CNN. Eric has a dream in the Star Tribune article, a dream that one day a CNN meteorologist talks about the beautiful 90 degree weather in Minnesota and says, and up here in the north. So I'm going right. to work on that right. end of it. Good. And right. in the meantime, thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.